around for my agents. They couldn't have made it far. The intel we're chasing, it's a secret recording of Katagawa and the Calypsos. I hope it's worth it. Level 21 started off with a bang, literally, because I accidentally blew myself up with my Merv shotgun. I started to realize that everything was not rainbows and unicorns, just my bombs. Anyway, my next little task while I was up here on the space station was to collect some intel on Katagawa and the Calypso twins. However, I ended up falling into this pleasure pit. There are not enough sanitation wipes in the world. And while I could go into the particulars of exactly everything I did during the side mission, I instead present you with the best moment. <laughs> yeah, he was a bit overconfident. Anyway, uh, shooting gallery later, and uh, we were back on to the main mission. I gave Tannis another fragment of the vault key, no special dance moves this time, and headed up to the bridge where I completed the mission, hit level 2, and could finally get into Atlas. I took a little test drive of my new Starkiller pistol, which I honestly didn't use. However, the time had finally come. I had been holding off on this for a little while, but I decided to finally cash in a couple of my golden keys. I figured I might as well not do it early on because you usually get plenty of guns up at the front, but oh, I was due for a loot explosion. One thing that I did not like about these chests is that they gave me a lot of multiples. Four grenade mods and four shields, and obviously I can only equip one of those at a time. Luckily, the second time around, I got a few different things, like pistols and a class mod that would come in more handy. And so, I had to put away these childish things. My diamond butt bomb had just become too underleveled for the quest that I was going on next. It was also around this time that I finally figured out how to change the default skins of my guns. I knew that this was possible, I just didn't know how, but apparently if you just go into the information panels, it is an option that you can get to pretty easily. Since I cannot have a diamond horse for a bomb, I would make all of my guns look exactly like it. After a quick and very cathartic trip to finally kill Killabolt, and show him that I'm grown now. I got assaulted by a Rick and Morty cosplayer, who is doing a bang up job, by the way. Fickle Rick dropped a legendary shotgun that would have been great if it were not like nine levels under my current. I killed off an Amber Lamps, who indeed does need an Amber Lamps now, and marched into Atlas HQ. Through a darkened hallway, I saw a faint light. It drew me close but I could not go to it. Out on the veranda, I battled some Malawan troops, and someone left this turret seat completely unattended. That shall not stand. Can I take this with me? Like, for the rest of the game, can I just take this turret with me? No? Damn. I completed a couple crew challenges while I was out here, opened up my Typhon chest, which had a slightly better legendary shotgun, and started to question if Reese is paying his Atlas troops enough, because they lazy. Hey guys, did you not see the bad guy right behind you? I looked at some giant fish tanks for an inordinate amount of time, only to realize that most of the fish were dead. A quick raid of Reese's office, and I uncovered a long drop down, which can only mean one thing in Borderlands, we're about to have a boss fight. Katagawa had gotten himself a Zero-style ninja suit. Who do you think wore it better? I'm going with Zero. Katagawa was, by far, the most frustrating boss I had faced so far. Not difficult, mind you, just frustrating. The arena that he is in has a bunch of these power generators. He warps between them, sucks the energy out of them, and replenishes his shields. And since it's very hard to track him as he just sprints around the field, it's also incredibly hard to know where he's going to land. You could take the generators offline for short periods of time, but they come back in full force, and then he just jumps to them when you're not looking. He can also make duplicates of himself, which is also incredibly annoying, because you end up fighting his clones and not doing direct damage to him. 
My biggest problem was ammunition, and a couple of my guns had already run dry by the time this boss battle was over. Now in the clear, I could finally answer Reese's most important question, whether the mustache looked good on him. I chose to be nice and tell him that it looked great, although I might have been slightly sarcastic about it. It's the best thing anyone has done to their face ever. It deserves a medal. I got a cute nod to Telltale Games and hit level 23. I got a side mission to look for Terry. However, I had no idea what Terry was supposed to look like. Are you Terry? No? I got intrigued by a voice behind a door and a strange monster with an exposed brain. However, nothing really happened here, and I got very, very confused. After looking the mission up in a wiki, I found out that Ratch were supposed to attack me at this point, but they're probably hibernating, so I moved on to something else. While I was on Promethea, I decided to complete a few of the crew challenges and minor side missions that I had neglected, or couldn't figure out how to do before. At this point, the level was so low on these missions that it was mostly just housekeeping so that I could knock it off my list. After kind of completing Ziff's vengeance mission, okay, all bases covered. we could finally put the vault key together and go to an actual vault for the first time in the game. This was exciting, but also nerve-wracking, because it's usually at crucial moments like this in Borderlands games where one of the major characters dies. All right, Maya, let's gear up! First of all, what should I bring? I was kind of hoping it was Ava. Zero used his sword of unlocking. You seek the highway. I will clear the path for you. Cool swords are handy. It was finally time for a girl's road trip. Just Mose and Maya, hitting the road, smashing some bandits, blowing things up, good times. We blasted our way through to a Polyon station, and oh no, it's gonna be Maya, right? They always have a character do really cool stuff right before they kill them off, in like a personal mission that you do with them. I really hoped I was wrong. Maya, could you get out of the way? I can't get, I can't get through the door. Maya, oh! I'm rooting for you here, but you're making it very hard. For some reason, the Guardians are back to being pretty angry at me. Not really sure why. I kind of thought that they wanted to work with the Vault Hunters after the events in pre-sequel, but then again, I feel like there's a few things that happened in pre-sequel that are just kind of out the door when we get to this narrative. Like any self-respecting Vault, this one had a big scary monster that attacks you immediately when you open it. This lovely fellow is called the Rampager. Sounds approachable. Besides being an absolute damage sponge and having a few forms that he evolves into, the Rampager was just tedious more than anything else. There were certain times where he was just simply immune to all damage. And it seemed to always happen when Auto Bear was active, which is just really bad timing. After using basically all the ammunition ever, I was able to take down the Rampager, I hit level 24, and I got a legendary rocket launcher in the process. The most important thing is that it looked cool, right? Inside the vault, I was able to get myself an Iridian Resonator. Finally, all those Iridian deposits I've been passing by in the world could be smashed. By the way, guess what the first thing was that I did? Smash! What you hiding, Space Rocks? Back outside, a cutscene played, and I knew that this could not bode well. Something bad was bound to happen, and the Chuckle Twins here are usually a bad omen altogether. Tyrene stole the power of a Vault Beast, because that's apparently something she can do. Tyrene and Maya then engaged in a game of who can grab the most obnoxious character. Personally, it's kind of a toss-up at this point. Unfortunately, Troy took a page out of Thanos' playbook and decided to Infinity Gauntlet snap Maya out of existence. Of course it was Maya. I was really hoping that I was wrong about that. Inevitably, the most put-together and reasonable characters are going to be the ones that suffer the most. No! Back on Sanctuary, we pressed F to pay respects to Maya, or at least we tried, but Lilith's not exactly great with speeches. Fine, I'll say something. I knew Maya when she was alive. I preferred her that way. And Tannis was certainly not a better option. 
We should be hunting down the Calypsos and making them pay for what they did! Ava, thinking she was in charge, actually made probably the best argument. I did choose to talk to her afterward, but only because it was an optional mission and I was really hoping there was another reward in it for me. Also, I cared deeply. <clears throat> yes, it mattered a lot that she was okay. <clears throat> yep. Crazy Earl Pitchford sold me on a pretty sweet new SMG I could buy. With all that sweet, sweet iridium I've been picking up. I don't want to see that crap at all again. The Calypsos debuted another one of their very tasteful viral videos. Truly auteurs, those two. And then we were whisked away to Eden 6. A dead person in the middle of the road had a mission for me, so that was new. I still couldn't inspect these symbols. But as I was just walking along, minding my own business, I suddenly hit level 25. A well-placed sign warned me about deadly wildlife in the area. Most people are aware that this is just a suggestion, not like a law or anything. So I decided to check it out. The sign was not lying. In fact, a giant dinosaur wanted to eat me. Luckily, this was actually a legendary hunt, and I didn't know that until this very moment, but at least I could get one of the crew challenges out of the way while I was here. I stumbled upon a really good class mod in a refrigerator of all places. Oh yeah, gotta try this out. Checked out the latest creature feature from the sci-fi channel. Oh man, hope I don't have to fight that thing. Call, call Ian Zeering. <laughs> and rolled, rolled, rolled my way up to Naughty Peak so that I could meet Wainwright Jacobs, the current head of, surprise, surprise, the Jacobs Corporation. See, that cult is holding Alistair on a prison called the Anvil. The Alistair he refers to is Sir Hammerlock. Turns out the children of the vault have him captured in a prison, and it's time to break him out. Upon arriving at the prison, I was tasked with finding a meat slab. And after searching my brain for about five seconds, I could think of only one person who that would refer to. And I was right, it was Brick. Of course it was Brick. Since Brick is the ultimate wingman and could pretty much keep my enemies at bay, I decided to try out a little bit of the smart bullet technology in Atlas guns. And if I fire a little tracking puck at an enemy, I can then make bullets home right in on them, which is pretty useful actually. Of course, that does assume that I'm able to get a tracker effectively on that enemy, but still. Nice fight. Usually I'm a solo brawler, but that duet was baller. I gotta go help out our sniper. You meet up with Crunk Bunny. A sniper and someone who would call themselves Crunk Bunny. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know who these characters are going to be. And all I could think was, finally. Now, I should warn you, Crunk Bunny is a damn prodigy with explosives, but how do I say this? She's nuttier than squirrel shit. Oh yeah, that had to be Tina. There's absolutely no one else who fits that description. Please let it be Tina. However, before I could confirm the identity of Crunk Bunny, I hit level 26, so... We will uncover that mystery on the next episode.